Uh, uh, Daniel uh, Sinet uh, is a professor in sustainable built environments with over 20 years experience of researching green infrastructure, including the regeneration of brownfields and contaminated land. She is also the director of the Center of Sustainable Planning uh, and en uh, Environments at the University of West uh, of Environments, uh, Bristol, UK. And uh, the topic uh, of her presentation is understanding uh, people's perspectives on post-mining landscapes. So uh, I uh, welcome uh, Dani to conduct her presentation. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dani Sinet. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I guess this probably follows on quite nicely from the, the previous presentation, actually. Um, so just to give you a bit of background about myself, my background is in soil science and I spent quite a few years before I started in my current role working for forest research. And tomorrow morning, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of that research, but essentially m most of my work kind of started off looking at um, how we grow uh, trees primarily, but, but also other kind of woody vegetation on contaminated and brownfield sites. And from that, I've moved more into thinking about the benefits of doing that and, and not just on contaminated and brownfield sites, but just kind of urban, um, urban sites more generally, and also looking at what people living in, in communities want from those sorts of sites. So this piece of research that I'm going to talk about now was funded as part of a larger project looking at whether or not we could go back to some of our historic mines and reprocess the mine waste. So in the UK, lots of our mines are, um, are very old and, and the land has been left derelict, but the processing at, at that time was quite inefficient. So there's quite high levels of metals in a lot of those sites. So this project the, the the technical side which we didn't do that was being carried out by um, the universities of Cardiff and Warwick was looking at whether or not it was possible and economically viable to go back to those sites and reprocess the waste and our part of the research myself and, and Margaritas was understanding what some of the constraints might be to that both in terms of what people want but also lots of these sites as, as I'll show in a second are protected um, and I, I think I guess, you know, the, the method that we used as well is perhaps of interest to you. So in terms of how we actually went about understanding these different perspectives. So just to give you a bit of background, there's a, a big history of, of metal um, uh, mineral extraction in England and Wales. So there's about 100,000 former mine sites of which about 5,000 of them are metalliferous mines. And you know, in terms of the kind of historic um, situation, actually requiring people to restore these sites is relatively new. So we've got, you know, hundreds of, of years of, of metal extraction, or actually a bit longer going back to Roman times, but no requirement for, for people to restore those sites. So we've got lots of very heavily contaminated abandoned sites around the UK. Lots of these are causing problems in terms of human and ecological health. Uh, the vast majority are not vegetated, even through kind of natural revegetation processes. Um, uh, and so they're, they're causing a kind of aesthetic problem as well as a, a risk to human and ecological health. Some of them are under pressure for redevelopment, although that's um, many of them are in rural areas, so that's not so much of a consideration, although, although a few have been developed for things like business parks and commercial uses. But they are under pressure for remediation because of the water quality and the, the dust problems that they cause. And also, as, as I explained, part of this project was whether or not they could be remined to extract resources, particularly for, for the kind of e-tech metals like lithium, which were, you know, were, were a waste when these when these um, mines were originally developed. 
Um, but their age and the kind of natural processes that have taken place on them since closure mean that lots of them have very high ecological and cultural value. So around um, just over a quarter um, of all mines are co-located with a designation. Either that could be because they're protected habitats or for their cultural value, their kind of industrial heritage, or because they're in a, a larger landscape designation like a na national park or something like that. And in England, it's kind of, up, you know, it's around 84% of these metal mines have at least one other designation on them. And that really limits actually what you can do with some of these sites. You know, some of the some of the metal sites have got species on them that are unique to that one individual site. You know, and, and those, you know, particularly things like lichens and bryophytes, they exist because of the metal pollution that's there. So if you clean that up and um, restored the site, you know, you would lose you would lose that. Um, similarly, lots are protected for their industrial heritage, either because of the, the buildings that are on the site, but also because they give um, the wastes, the kind of layering of the wastes gives a picture of how mining technology developed over over time. So there's quite a few sort of physical constraints. And um, this is, you know, it's you know there's a real kind of romanticism around the mining heritage within the UK so um, I don't know whether it's it's made it over to to Ukraine or uh, or to the states but we have a quite a popular TV show called Poldark about, which is based on a book which is kind of set around the mining um, industry the image in the foreground there is a former mine um, uh, mine works in that area has been restored for housing, um, as well as there's a, a kind of community centre and a cafe and an event space there. There's lots of mining museums around the country, and we've got two World Heritage Sites, one which is the um, the, the top uh, the top image there, the Cornish, uh, well, it's Cornwall and West Devon, technically World Heritage Site, but there's also another one associated with coal mining in, in Blanavon in South Wales. So these are just some images of what these sites kind of look like. These sites all shut down, you know, decades ago, and you can see this is, um, I think this is uh, Devon Great Consoles, um, you know, so, you know, very, very sparse vegetation on a few, but very little, um, you know, even decades later. So that's the kind of context of what we're dealing with. So what we wanted to do was understand what the perspectives were of those living within these landscapes in terms of their um their kind of priorities for the futures of these sites. I think there's a sort of uh, an assumption within um, kind of, I guess, policy and, and perhaps to a lesser extent acad academia, that local people um, would be against there being any redevelopment of these sites, but that they would, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, in terms of going back to them and remining, but also that they would you know, want to see them revegetated or whatever. So we just, you know, there's there's an assumption, I guess, that everybody thinks the same within these um, within these these communities, and so we wanted to essentially test that with find out whether or not that that was accurate. Um, so we went to six different mining landscapes that you can see here. So two of them are in the southwest, Red Ruth and Tavistock, which are both um, within this World Heritage Site. Barmouth in North Wales was uh, a kind of gold mining area. And Capelbanga, which is in mid Wales, was um, primarily um, lead, I think. Um, and then Reith and Matlock are at the kind of north and south Pennines. So these areas are quite different in their sort of, I guess, their socioeconomic um, standing at the moment. So Redruth and Tavistock are in the southwest. They have, um, there's a lot of tourism in those areas. They are often areas where people might go to retire, for example. I mean, Redruth also is home to Campbell School of Mines, but, you know, they are... Um, 
a kind of particular location in terms of the the amount of tourism that, are, that is in those areas. Reith and Matlock are also quite um, touristy and there's a reasonable amount of um, retiree um, kind of in migration I suppose to those areas but far less than in the southwest and it tends to be associated more with kind of hiking and hill walking and those kinds of things. Matlock is, um, is a reasonably large town um, that has you know suffered a reasonable amount of economic decline. Kapilbanga in mid Wales is very rural um, and so there's there's not a kind of great deal of, of other um, investment or infrastructure within that area. And Barmouth is a coastal town um, that, again, similarly, uh, you know, it's had it, it's um, had a reasonable amount of kind of economic decline um, over the last few decades. So they're quite different in terms of the, the sort of wider um, economic context. So we ran workshops with 38 people from across those um, those areas. We sent out, we randomly selected uh, addresses and we sent out invitations and then we put um, adverts in kind of local um, social media and um, kind of local groups. What we didn't do was go to the local kind of mine waste appreciation society or anything like that. So we wanted to get as far as as far as you can do, you know, a representative range of people rather than those from special interest groups. So what we did was use a method called Q method, which I think is you know a really 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 good um, way of of disentangling some of these different perspectives if you if you end up being sold on on this method after this presentation I guess I would say that it's it's quite labor intensive up front so you need to do a lot of work to develop your statements but essentially what what you have is a series of statements that represent the breadth of opinion about a subject area so in our case this was about mining legacy and, and long-term management and you can get those statements from different places so you could do interviews and I'll, I'll mention at the end another project we've got running at the moment but you could get those statements from interviews you can get them from literature from um, you know kind of written articles or a mixture of both what we decided to do for this one was a literature review which included the academic literature, but also policy and guidance and also um, local press. So we went to the local press within these uh, areas to see whether or not there had been anything coming from that. So for example, in, in Cornwall, there has been a lot of media attention on the reopening of one of the mines um, to, to go back and, and, and process lithium. So we had some press, um, kind of statements um, from that. So local politicians, for example, talking about what reopening the mine would bring to the area, for example. Um, so you can see there the, the kind of the types of statements that we got. So we, we were looking for things that talked about the need for restoration of mine waste and the benefits of that and what those different restoration options might be, whether it was, you know, for example, for amenity use or to, um, you know, develop housing or commercial infrastructure or for wildlife or, or whatever, whether or not um, the mine should be, the mine waste should be reused, um, the environmental consequences of mineral extraction, both in terms of the, the previous extraction, but also any future reworking, what what the kind of preferences were for the ultimate land uses that these mines should be, you know, whether it is around amenity or nature or whatever. Um, the, the relationship between those, um, those kind of other sectors like tourism or, or job creation or, or whatever, and then some trade-offs between those. So we started off with 240 statements and you need to, nobody wants to sit and go through 240 statements. Um, so you need to kind of reduce it down. So we, we removed those that were um, repetitive. 
we tried to make sure that we picked those that were written in as a kind of plain English as possible. So removing technical jargon and, and, and that kind of thing. And what we ended up with was 33 statements. And I'll, I'll show you in a second what we asked people to do with them. Um, and then we also had a, a short questionnaire about you know, people's responses to those where we also asked some social demographic questions um, as well. So with a Q method, what you do is you, you've got your statements and then you give people a grid and ours look like this. It, you set the grid depending on how many statements you've got. But what you have, um, you can see here is you've got 33 boxes essentially and 33 statements. And the boxes go from least like how I think to most like how I think. And you ask people to put one statement per box. So what this does is it means that people can't say, for example, everything's very important or everything's very unimportant or I strongly disagree with everything or I'm neutral about everything. What you're asking people to do is make a choice between things. And people can take as long as they like to do it. So we, you know, we were sort of doing this over 45 minutes to an hour. And then in the questionnaire, we were asking people to write a little bit about why did you put the thing, the statements that you put in plus four, most like how I think, why did you put those statements in, in, that, in those boxes? And then what you do um, is you, you basically run a principal component analysis. So that is looking for factors that, that bring the Q sorts together. So the, the subject um, of the, of the, the research is the Q sort, not, not the individual people. So what we, what we ended up with was five different perspectives. So the analysis is kind of looking for similarities in the way that people have responded, and then it's kind of grouping them together, and then differences perhaps with, a, with the responses of other people. So the five um, perspectives that we had were what I mean, we we called them this that they didn't they didn't name themselves were what the group that were the, the largest were what we called the kind of preservationists and they wanted to maintain the status quo they recognized that there is this rich cultural heritage around them um, and they wanted the sites left as they were even if that meant that they were unvegetated etc and they wanted them protected primarily for their heritage value um, and you can see um, some of the quotes there. So the damage is done, leave them safe, but untouched. You know, uh, they were they were very, um, you know, negative about the idea of going back to these sites and re extracting metals. So the next group were the environmentalists. They were they had some overlap with the preservationists in that they they kind of recognized um, the value of these sites, but they were more motivated by by cleaning them up or reworking them if that meant that there was there was going to be an improvement to water quality or to pollution mitigation. I'll come on to this in the sec in a second, but they also valued the role of experts in the kind of decision making process and the longer term management. Um, they they did recognise the the um, contribution that these sites might make to nature conservation, but that wasn't their primary motivator. Their primary concern was about water quality and pollution. In contrast to the nature enthusiasts who were much more uh, focused on prioritizing vegetation establishment on the mine sites, they recognize that they, the contribution that they either are already making or that they could making, and they want to see the sites greened. You know, they're not, they're not motivated at all by, um, by kind of holding on to these, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of buildings or leaving the wastes as, you know, kind of scars on the landscape, you know, they wanted them to be restored. And so they were more positive about the, the idea of reworking the waste if that would then mean, mean that they could be greened, they could be restored afterwards. And particularly if that greening was, um, 
you know, focusing on native species, for example. So there was a recognition in, in these groups, which you can see on the um, on the quote there, that they, you know, in, in the past in the UK, a lot of the um, mine restoration that happened was with, you know, very tolerant, very fast growing species that perhaps weren't the best ecologically. So they kind of wanted to see, you know, some sensitive restoration that was um, in keeping with the, the kind of natural ecosystems, but they wanted to see some vegetation establishment. The next group is the, uh, the industry supporters. So they very much prioritised the local economy. Um, they were, you know, some of the comments were, were, you know, talking about the loss of jobs that had come in the area when the mining industry ceased and that that had never really been replaced by, a, by a, you know, a, another industry apart from in, in some of the areas tourism. They were much more supportive of mineral extraction in general, but also the, the reworking of these sites because of the job creation. Um, you know, and, and they talked, as that, that quote says, you know, that, that taking these industries away had depressed their areas. You know, they also talked about things like younger people moving away because there weren't jobs. And that meant, for example, local schools were being shut down because they didn't have enough children to, to, to support them, etc. And then the final group were, were, were what we called the landscape lovers. So they were quite similar to the nature enthusiasts in that they want to see the sites greened, but for a quite a different reason. So they were much more um, motivated by the amenity potential of these sites. So they, 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 they were the, the far more kind of, um, concerned about the the loss of vegetation and you know but but not so focused on if we were going to green that should be prioritizing um, ecosystems it was much more about just kind of greening them you know by any means necessary almost um, and again they were they were um, open to reworking as as a means to achieve that okay what this method also allows you to do is you it, it, it pulls out what are called consensus statements. So these are statements that all of the all of the perspectives agree on, basically. So there isn't they aren't um, differentiating between the, the perspectives. So four of the groups, so that's essentially everybody apart from the environmentalists, were um, very mistrustful of experts. So we had a, a, a statement in there about experts, but another statement in there about the role of local people. And you can you can see some of the quotes here. I believe that expert knowledge is very important, but the range of expertise is crucial and that they work collaboratively with local people. Experts are unlikely to have cultural history as their first priority. And um, so there was a real kind of mistrust of experts. And I think that's partly, you know, historically where these sites have been greened or, or where people have come in and tried to green them. That has often been led by, you know, either national agencies or, or consultancies or whoever that have, um, you know, kind of been funded to do that, but they haven't necessarily worked with local people. And, and in many cases, that greening's failed, you know, so then the, the local people are left with this sort of half um, completed job. Um, and, the, and then all of the groups were unified about the concerns they have on, uh, um, about the impact the wastes are having on water quality. So they were all much more, I guess, persuadable um, in terms of reworking or in, in terms of any kind of restoration of these mines, if that would result in water quality improvements. You know, so you can see some of the quotes there, cleaning up pollution must be the first priority, um, you know, must not be compromised um, in terms of the water, the water quality. So just to conclude, so I think, you know, going back to what, where we, we started from, that residents do value their mining heritage, um, but there was a, a lot of nuance there in terms of what it is they, they value, whether it's nature, whether it's the, the industrial heritage. Um, 
and you know and and what they see as being the priorities for restoration so they're concerned about further exploitation but there isn't a, a kind of a high level of agreement about what they would like to see happening with these sites so as i say some of them want them left as they are others are much more open to restoration either for nature or for amenity use um, and particularly if that can be coupled with water quality um, and water quality improvements and, and more kind of sensitive restoration as opposed to some of the restoration that we've perhaps seen in the past. So there's a, a couple of papers there from, from this work. So one of them is, is basically the, the thing that I've just presented. Then we also did some work looking at the extent of co-location with these designations across um, mineral extraction generally, not, not just metal mines. And then a bit of work with our, our collaborators in Cardiff looking at the, um, the kind of potential for, for resource extraction from these. And at the moment, we've got another project going on at the moment, again, with, with Cardiff University, looking at, it actually links quite nicely to some of the things that, that Ronald was talking about, looking at whether or not we can um, develop landfills in such a way that the uh, resources are concentrated within the landfill for later extraction. And then whether or not using plants, uh, using plant lixiviants to do that, but whether or not that can be coupled with some of these other benefits like for biodiversity, for, um, for amenity use, etc. Okay, that's me. Thank you. Has Thank anybody you got much. any questions? Thank you very much, Dani, for your wonderful uh, presentation. And I think that this is the only presentation which uh, that much go in depth to the social aspect of landscape restoration. And we should not definitely overlook it in our projects. Uh, so uh, uh, one question is, uh, uh, is there the locals currently uh, uh, get any uh, benefit from mining? Uh, are there any active mining uh, in this area? And uh, are these depressive regions, or at least some of them are depressive regions? Yeah, so it's quite mixed. I think in terms of metal mining, um, which was what, what we were focused mm -hmm. on in that work, we don't have any i think i'm right in saying we don't have any active metal mines in the uk left one of them has just been given planning permission so the one that i mentioned which they're going back to reprocess for lithium has been given planning permission but it's interesting um because the i i went and had a look at the the kind of the application and it's very, very mechanized. You know, they're anticipating, I think, being in and out in something like six years. So in terms of longer term job creation, you know, this was in an area that employed 10,000 men in the mines. And we're talking about a couple of hundred people for five or six years. So, you know, it it just isn't, um, you know, even, even where there is, um, I guess a kind of revisiting of, of these mine wastes. It's not going to turn these places around in terms of, of job creation. There's still quite a lot of other mineral extraction going on in the UK, particularly things like sand and gravel. Um, very controversially, a new coal mine has just been given planning uh, permission, which um, lots of people are extremely unhappy about um, for obvious reasons. Um, but there, there is a lot of, um, you know, kind of stone and, and sand and gravel extraction that still happens, um, often in the areas where there's a lot of need in terms of house building and things like that. There's still a lot of lime, limestone quarrying going on. Um, so the, the areas that are more, um, I guess, uh, kind of depressed are those that are that that really only had metal mining um where there isn't the kind of limestone and the sand and gra gravel as well um, and they are the areas where they've got very beautiful landscapes so they are also um you know there's a lot of tourism but the tourism is very seasonal so they're you know they are 
Um, yeah, there's lots of there's lots to unpack in that question. There's there's real sensitivities in the UK in some of these areas. House prices are very, very high because there's a lot of second home holiday ownership, lots of Airbnbs, that kind of thing. And, and local people are not able to afford, to, you know, to live in those areas. So, you know, in the, in the southwest, there's been a, um, you know, relatively recently a hospital shut down because they can't get nurses because the nurses can't afford to live there. You know, so there are real tensions around tourism and, and other, um, yeah, and other sectors in, in some of these areas. Maybe ask my question. Uh, so, um, as I understand your methodology, uh, you... Um, collected these uh, statements which you presented for evaluation to your participants uh, yourself i mean that your research team collected you did not do any kind of preliminary work to educate participants on this um, no mm -hmm. no and it's quite that's a good question and it's quite important with the q method that you don't assume mm -hmm. that people you you haven't kind of coach them to to have uh you know an answer so we we gave a short presentation that basically explain the method. Um, and, you know, I mean, ethically, we have to, you know, they, ha they had a participant information sheet, which explained, I guess, the kind of wider project, but in, you know, as far as possible in neutral language. And that was why we wanted to remove a lot of the technical terms as well. So, you know, because people haven't had any training in, in this. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, what's what was really interesting actually was my colleague Margarita, who I, I did this work with, is in our science communication unit, and when we were talking to participants, kind of after we had after we had had done the the queue with them, um, they were saying how useful they found it as a way of understanding the complexity of decision making. And that actually they'd come into it with very firm ideas about this will always be acceptable, uh, unacceptable. I'm going to go in and tell these researchers that I disagree. And actually, when confronted with, but what about the water quality and what about job creation or whatever, they realised that actually they, you know, there was a little bit more um, compromise or nuance in, in their thinking. And so Margarita went back, which I haven't talked about at all in this presentation, she went back to them and evaluated their experience of the method from a science communication point of view. And actually that was really positive. Um, I should, there's a, a, a paper from that work as well. If you look at, look at us, if you look us up, you'll find it. But ba basically it was, you know, um, participants said that they found it a very, very useful process in terms of understanding the complexities of these sorts of sites and, and these different balances and trade-offs that we need to make. So I think, you know, I, I found it a really useful method from, from that side as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, like the, the second part of my question linked to that, that uh, if we apply um, uh, your method uh, or your approach, let's say, to Ukraine, uh, because uh, what we try to do, what we, what we advocate is a quite big uh, transformation of the landscape and it will be baked up by the social transformation because these regions uh, after liberation, after the end of the war, they will be like totally devastated. Uh, it was exactly like many of these regions were already de depressive regions. People won't come back. And um, uh, so if we would uh, apply this community work and we would like uh, to promote some transformation, how should we act in a way that we won't um, pose our view over community, uh, but at the same time, time we get community informed and capable to make some decisions which make uh, the future of this community better i th i think i i think i understand the, the question mm -hmm. um so if i answer a different question then tell me um but mm -hmm. i i mean i think it's about making sure the question the statements are right uh you know so we this is why I say it takes a long time to develop those statements and we piloted them with people before we went out to the to the to the residents as well and I guess it's 
perhaps not asking so much about how you're going to do something technically, but perhaps what you want the end point to be. Um, you know, and, and I guess, I mean, there's lots of guidance on how to construct Q method statements. And, you know, if you're interested, I can send you a, a list, um, you know, but it's about getting statements that don't ask, um, don't ask several questions within one statement. So you're mm. just asking one kind of one thing at a time, essentially. And perhaps if it's if it's very big in terms of the topic area, perhaps it's a case of doing several smaller cues, just targeting on, you know, one sort of one bit of the jigsaw puzzle at a time, perhaps. So you could you could um yeah, I don't know, maybe maybe you you have one one set of Q methods that you know that is just mm -hmm. about kind of land use alternatives and then one that is about okay well actually if we're going to prioritize agroforestry what might that look like or do, does that make sense I mean maybe you could mm -hmm. um yeah because what you don't want is hundreds and hundreds of statements because people will get fed up with doing it yeah 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 indeed uh, I mean that we need to, to do this uh, gradual uh, transformation uh, uh, I have a questions regarding your slides where you represented different groups as uh, circles. Does yep. the size of this circle uh, um, indicate the size of the group and the, yes. the, the size of the overlap also in, like it's some statistical information? No, no, not the, mm -hmm. not the overlap. That was just purely aesthetics from I my see. perspective, but the size of the group, not precisely, but kind of broadly. So the, the larger the bubble, the more people were in that perspective. Mm -hmm. But I you see. can see in the paper, it gives you the exact numbers. I, I can't mm -hmm. remember what they mm -hmm. were. Uh, but uh, I mean, uh, roughly, uh, at least what I could see from the slide, the groups are more or less the same size. Apart from that one large one, the preservationists, that preservationists was by far the, the biggest. biggest. And then the others, yeah, were, were broadly the same size. I think the smallest group was the, um, the, the industry supporters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and, and I guess it's, I mean, I didn't talk about this um so much and really with a i guess with a q method the participants aren't aren't the, aren't the subjects but just very kind of um anecdotally there was quite you know most of the industry support came from the locations that don't have tourism so mm. it was from the locations where there is there there hasn't been any kind of replacement for the mining really mm. um and and tended to be the younger people i think there was certainly in some of the locations the participants had moved to that area mm. in retirement and so they had signed up for you know this landscape mm -hmm. and anything mm -hmm. that threatened that was you know negative mm. and they they you know being blunt, they didn't really care about jobs or schools shutting down or those kinds of things because that's not what they that's not what what motivated them to move I to see. the area. Mm -hmm. I see, uh, uh, but uh, I mean that in terms of um, how you say uh, uh, in terms of uh, they uh, evaluating uh, of different options, they um, the overlap was not very big between different groups um it it depends which group um mm. yeah so i mean it isn't you don't really get when you do the analysis you don't mm. really get a kind of clear mm -hmm. divide like these statements mm -hmm. are over here and these statements are over here it's more that what you get is statements loaded onto different perspectives and then you interpreting that and you, you kind of telling a story around those things. So there could have been, you know, so for example, with the, the kind of um, that, you know, the nature enthusiast, the, the nature enthusiasts and the landscape lovers, there were a lot of similarities mm -hmm. between those. Yes. It's just that there were subtle differences mm -hmm. pulling them in this direction versus this direction. Mm -hmm. Whereas perhaps the industry supporters, there was less overlap um, with, I don't know, for example, the, the nature enthusiasts. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, That's okay. Uh, gr great presentation. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you from uh, our participants.